I get a lot of strength and power from being disciplined. I get a lot of strength and power from just trusting myself to do what most people find, find difficult. I just want to keep moving forward, keep understanding each level. There's been times where I, I could have stopped. Nobody ever told me to stop. My parents, my friends saw me an emotional wreck. Although they said, like, get a rest, look after yourself, nobody ever told me to stop. Whether it's exercise, whether it's business, whether it's friendships, relationships or anything like that, it's trying to be the best version of yourself most of the time. You just need to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. I don't think you ever achieve something by being lazy, um, so you just, just need to work really, really hard. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time again. It is the six rounds podcast format on the Blueprint podcast. This is one of our audience's favorite topics, and I'm very pleased today to welcome a very special guest. This is his second time on the six rounds podcast. Some of you may know him, some of you may not. He's been on the six round podcast episode previously. He also recorded a deals, deals, deals podcast episode most recently where he shared a deal where they made over seven figures in equity and haven't had a conversation today. It's not the only deal that they're doing that looks like that. He's a very good friend of mine. He's an ultimate high performer. He is a sub two, four, five, two hours, 45 minute marathon runner. He is an absolute machine. His name is Ian Bauer. He's my friend and he is here today to do six rounds on the Property Entrepreneur podcast. Thanks. Ian, you're up. <laughs> I think I went first last time, didn't I? Nice. So first question is a multiple of questions, quick fire. So not sure how well it's going to work, but um, I read a book by Tim Ferriss and it's got 11 questions that he asks um, high performers to answer. So I just wanted to go through these 11 with you quick fire nice. to, see, uh, to see where they land. So first question is what book or books have you given out most as a gift or what's one to three books that you have greatly, that, that have greatly influenced your life? So in my early days uh, was the Something Laws of Invaluable Growth by John Maxwell. Uh, more re uh, for everybody is Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Great and most book. recently, uh, yeah, absolutely game-changing book. And most recently is Stillness, which I actually recommended to you. I've read that, yeah, thank you. By Ryan Holiday, for people who are trying to come down from the high. They're, the, they're my three. Any, any other game-changers for you? Uh, so for me, Magic of Thinking Big was the first book I read, and that just opened my mind to personal development. And I think uh, three, I think for me, longevity is a big thing now. So life span, life force, and outlive a, a three brilliant David books. Sinclair is literally like, I sleep to him. Yeah, <laughs> is, is amazing. It's he amazing. Is. Um, so question number two, uh, what purchase for £100 or less has most positively impacted your life over the past six six months to, say, two years? Fantastic question. You can pass on any of these and we can come back if you, if you don't have an immediate answer. What's yours? So I've got a set of Bose sunglasses. They're a couple of hundred quid, so a bit more, but I got given them for free, so I thought I can fit them in there. But I, I essentially listen to a book a week by by these. have just been a, an absolute game changer for me because uh, I do a lot of running, as you know, so I, I listen to them whilst out running. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just trying, uh, I would say Tupperware. <laughs> <laughs> Tupperware, so I'm big on eating my oats. I haven't got them today because I didn't have time to make them this morning, but I would say a good solid piece of Tupperware to, to, make, to eat my oats when I'm out and about. Good, good, good. Uh, so question number three, how has a failure or apparent failure set you up for later success? So do you have a favourite failure of yours? Oh, Mankle House. Man <laughs> Mankle House, uh, that was nearly a million quid I uh, screw up and I've ended up making a million quid on it. It was... Without a doubt, that was the biggest turnaround. Good, good, good. Um, so two, two that spring to immediate thought. So one is selling my business. Um, it, it didn't kind of go to plan. It kind of went a bit wrong after a while. But um, the life that we have now is is just is just the life we've always worked and dreamed for. So, so that's one of them. And I, I snapped my femur and shattered my shin when about twelve years ago, and. Uh, I was in a wheelchair for about three months or something like that, and uh, since then I've 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 ran some pretty decent times, and it's just made me realise that um, you can, if you put your mind to something, you can you can push yourself a lot a lot harder. It was a it was a good great failure for me, really. Nice. Um, number four, if you had a gig gigantic billboard and you could have anything on it that millions or billions of people could see, what what would you what would you write on there? Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. I like that. I like that. 
Um, what about you? Uh, discipline is freedom, I think, for yeah, me. Yeah, oh, yeah. Bang on. Five. Um, Success and failure are very predictable, I'd actually find. Yeah, yeah. That, was, <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is your saying, that is. So number five, what's one of the best or most worthwhile investments that you've ever made? It could be uh, money, time, energy. Um, I would say most recently, marketing spend. Somebody said to me, what's the biggest marketing spend you set? You put? I would say my Rolls Royce. The pound for pound, the biggest market, best best return on investment market and spend. And I would say a personal profile without a doubt for, for business. And I would say health. Just being healthy makes everything so much easier. I'd agree with that. Cool. Um, number six, what is an unusual habit or absurd thing that you love? Uh, well, everyone seems to think it's funny that I like having chickens. I've just ordered, my chicken coop gets delivered today. And I've got a dozen new chickens coming. I just love being out in nature, ch my chicken coop, things like that. What about you? Um, so nothing really, I guess the only absurd thing that I am quite fond of, Annette and I have a teddy bear. Oh yeah, ne Nemo. <laughs> Nemo that we quite like. So that's probably the thing, the thing for me. I would say my, my oats as well. I've got a whole setup in my kitchen. You might've seen it of my oats, my protein powder, my berries, my Gucci berries, my blueberries. I'm just obsessed with the perfect bowl of oats. So that's probably a bit of a strange thing to do. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, number seven, um, in the last five years, what new belief, behavior or habit has most improved your life? Understanding that you can put life before business. Very good. That's changed my life in the last three months. Uh, you? And what was the catalyst for that, do you think? Breaking through. In January, I did. I recorded a, a podcast called The Breakthrough Blueprint. And you know, the whole time you and I have known each other, I've sort of been hitting this glass ceiling of not getting to where I wanted to get to and searching and all that. Finally, actually breaking through and realizing that all those scripts that I've had for 20 years about work hard, work, you know, it's all about work, work ethic, to actually be coming out the other end now, it's crazy. It's like selling a business when you you own your business and it's your whole life and you think the world revolves around Revita Glaze. When you step out of it and you never speak to anyone again that you used to work with, you're like, wow, that was my <laughs> life for 14 years. And you step out of it and you're like, oh, wow, there's another whole life to live. I think that that's that was that was for me. Cool. Um, I would say um, a similar thing actually. Um, one of the things for me is I I don't need to do everything. So in Revitalize, I got good at pretty much everything and never invested in people early enough. And starting um, a new venture with Garrett, maybe eighteen months now, we've, we're just getting key people in quite quickly. Um, so that, that's a big one. And also fit, strong and healthy. I think those three things, if you fit, strong and healthy, it's just it just changes the game altogether. I've always been fit, relatively strong. But, you know, the healthy one was the uh, the third part in the uh, the pyramid for me. Nice. Uh, number eight, what advice would you give to a smart driven college student about to enter the real world? And what should they ignore? ignore? Um I think ignore the news and ignore your, ignore society. I think when we look at the people that make it, like you or everyone else, they just don't adhere to the normal like laws of society. We just the aim of the game is to break the rules and just step outside of it. So I would say just observe the masses and do the opposite. Very good. You? Um, I'd say find a mentor, work really hard, and do something that you like for free if if necessary. And uh, I think you just need to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Hundred um, percent. I can't remember who said that. Now Jim Rowan. So I think that's a that's a great saying. I don't think you ever achieve something by being lazy. Um, so you just just need to work really really hard. Although I, I completely agree. Like equally, Joe Rogan says he's the most disciplined, lazy person he knows. And actually, when you are a lazy entrepreneur and you don't want to do anything for yourself, the art of delegation becomes a lot easier because you just think. You never think I'm going to do this myself. Somebody else is going to do it. But I agree. Like I've, I, I, there's no way I got to where I am by being lazy. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think you're still working hard, but hard thinking. Yeah, smart. As, opp yeah. as opposed to as opposed to doing, which which I I think is a good idea. Fair. Um, what are bad recommendations you hear in your profession or areas or expertise? It's a really good question. What about you? Um, I think the get rich quick. Um, you know. Do, do no work, earn loads of money. I think those no money down um, all the time with no experience, uh, I think, I think is. Yeah, I was sort of going down that route. Um, yeah, that's in my head is that there's loads of ways not to do it. Um, and the reality is most people are running around building businesses that don't make money. And I would say it's find, like you said earlier, find a mentor that does. Yeah, I don't know. Um, everything that glitters isn't gold. 
Maybe. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> that's probably, Very true. Very that's true. That's probably part of it. Got 50 seconds left. Okay. In the last five years, what have you become better at saying no to? Everything. Everything. Very good. Yeah. I, I, Warren Buffett says the difference between successful people and very successful people is very successful people say no to pretty much anything, nothing. Since 2019, I've just, it's been a really hard journey of doing less rather than more. And I finally, I feel like I find, I genuinely feel like I've finally cracked it. I don't find it easy, but I think I've cracked it. And last question, uh, when you get overwhelmed or unfocused uh, or have lost your focus temporarily, uh, what do you do um, to kind of get you out of that rut? Take, take, move away. Don't start creating bigger to-do lists. Weekend off, holiday, recharge. That's like the biggest biggest thing. Yeah. Um, running, exercise and detox. So quite similar. Nice. We've never done that on six rounds before. That was very good. That was quite stressful. That was, <laughs> was trying, it? trying to read them all. Well, yeah, you did well. Yeah. That was bang on bang on uh, 10 minutes of the first round. So uh, the next one is uh, the fast lane. The fast lane. May yeah. or may not be surprised to see it turn up. You and I have experienced it, talked about it, debated it at length. What When we talk about the slow lane, middle lane, fast lane, just tell me what your thoughts are on the fast lane. Is there any other lanes? Um it's good that's the question. That's the question. So I think the fast lane for me is, is just what I'm used to. It's just it's just um the way I yeah, I'm quite I'm quite focused, quite disciplined. Um and I just I just like I just yeah, I'm just quite um yeah, just I guess I, I like being in that lane. How would you explain it to somebody? If somebody's listening to this and has never taught, heard the analogy of like the fast lane, what is the fast lane? Um Is this where you live? So it's it's trying to be the best version of yourself most of the time, and that's it. Whether it's exercise, whether it's business, whether it's friendships, relationships, or anything like that, it's it's just it's just trying to, yeah, it's just, it's just trying to be the best all the time. And why is it called the fast lane? Um, What's it like living in the fast lane? It it it's is it fast? I think if you ask me and my wife Annette, would have very, <laughs> very different answers. I I quite enjoy it a lot of the time. But equally, I do need to rest. So it's good. It's good to, if you want to do, I guess for me personally, I, if you want to achieve things, it, it helps me to do it quickly. Um, it, it helps me optimize um, whether it's training, whether it's business, whether it's, whether it's anything like that. It's just, you know, it's just a, it's just a, a quicker. A What's quick... the what stress levels like in the fast lane? Actually, my stress levels now are quite moderate. So um, when I took Revitaglase back, my stress levels were actually highest that they've been in a long period of time. So did you enjoy it? I enjoyed parts of it, but when it got to the, near the end, no. I think I think I don't mind the fast lane. It doesn't have to be stressful, but I think the stress from me comes where there's either too many moving parts or I take too many things on. So I, I guess my experience over the years. It's been the fast lane is okay on the proviso that I have a good team around me. So this year uh, or this business that Garrett and I have started is 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 great because we've taken key people on straight away. So effectively, it just allows us to get out the weeds quite quickly and go up the gears, but still stay in the in the fast lane. And would you align the fast lane with like the term beast mode when we talk about beast mode, which is like all in, let's go shoot for the stars, big days, like risking burnout. Would you say that is fast lane or is that just somebody who's not got a handle on it? Um, let's say I like racing cars. So yeah. the fast lane for me used to be get my car ready, do everything that involves getting my car ready, go to the race and doing the race and kind of, you know, either winning or, or not winning. And the racing, that's the part that I really enjoy. So I guess my version of the fast lane now is I, I, I have a pit crew with us or Garrett and I have a pit crew with us. And we get to race the car now. So we still get to do the bits that we really, really enjoy in the fast lane. But then at, on off season, we can go away for a month at the end of the year or we can go on holidays, which is, you know, which is things that we, we didn't really or I didn't really do without working previously. So I think for me, it's just uh, it's just it's just ingrained into me. I, I tried I tried doing nothing. And I, I think I think I'm just hungry. So uh, Garrett and I was talking about this. We tried we tried not doing any work. Yeah, uh, you've you've done the same thing. Um, Adam's done the same thing, or similar people have done the same thing. And I th I think it just comes down to whilst we've got this hunger in us, the fast lane is is our is our lane lane of choice. And where do you think the hunger comes from? Middle child syndrome, maybe. Okay. I, I, I don't nice. know. Nice. I don't know. Um, um, I, I've just always been really competitive. 
Um, but I, I guess I'm a lot more selective in what I'm competitive. Why, why do you think you are competitive? Like I, just, I just came out of the studio earlier and you were playing ping pong. And I was like, <laughs> I don't fancy this. Aaron's competitive. You're competitive. I was like, why, why, why do you think you are competitive? I think I've always had this inbuilt drive to be like the best at whatever I choose to do because I, I get a lot of satis satisfaction out of that. I think I think it's an inbuilt thing in definitely me to if you do something, do it do it your best, and it, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what what that is. So I think I think I think for me it's just I don't it's not a, a proactive thought. It's just it's just more of a, a feeling that I have. When you think about the fast lane, beast mode, competitiveness, always wanting to do your best, that sort of hunger, striving to a degree, not necessarily chasing the next thing, but chasing something, always sort of striving. Um, do you find there's any similarities between that and like addictive behavior and addiction? And do you struck, do you, would you say you're quite an addictive person? Like you've got an addictive nature. Or 100%. You... Yeah. 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 yeah 100%. Um, yeah, choose your poison wisely, I guess. Um, so, and you find when you use it to your advantage, and you f get addicted to something good like fighting, training, business, it always works well. Or do you find in the same way that if if, if someone was a drinker, a drink on a Friday night is great, but drinking whiskey at ten a.m. is like a bad move? Do you um, find that that rolls over to work? Yeah, I, th I think I think I think as as I get older, my my wisdom's a lot better now, so I can I can balance things. So, for example, when when we had Harry, our our, our boy, is sixteen months old now, um, I ran three marathons, did an ultra marathon, and um, and uh, did a Thai boxing charity fight. And uh, and when I when I look back and reflect on that, I kind of think that that is a lot to do. That's fast lane to me. That's but beast mode. Why would you do that? Because what I, are you searching for? So I think. What's the objective? So the the I mean for me like running a marathon I can run a marathon on a you know with three four weeks marathon training it wouldn't necessarily be super fast but it's so for me running a marathon is not necessarily difficult um, because I do loads of miles it's it's running a marathon at uh, a target of sub two four five pace is, is where it is where it gets hard um, so everything comes at cost and I think for me sometimes the cost of not doing my best is worse than the cost of taking the easy lane and I, and I think I think for me I, I get a lot of strength and power from being disciplined I get a lot of strength and power of from um, from from just trusting myself to do what most people find find difficult um, and why whilst I enjoy that it's it's uh, I think I'll continue doing it but the I think going into next baby am I going to do the same thing probably not no definitely not no it's interesting so so there, there is a, a level of wisdom there and what are your what are your thoughts well uh, i think the, the the older i get and the more wisdom i have around imparting my insight and stuff like that is to realize it, we're all at different levels of the lighthouse and also you can be at the same level looking out of a different window and it depends which morning you wake up on and what day you are because i'm now coming out of it for the first time ever i'm noticing a lot of my traits around addiction and also not for the best like Adam and I were away in Bali and we we're literally like ships that have passed in the night because we last time went away a year ago. He was off grid the whole time, chilled, meditating, etc., relaxed, low workload, low stress, high sort of balance. And we've completely flipped this time and he's back wired on coffees. He's like, you know, he's all guns blazing and I'm sort of having a slow start to the day and enjoying like my journaling and stuff. And, um, it's just, it's just interesting to acknowledge. And I think I'm definitely coming out and ready for a recharge. So I'm out of the fast lane, out of competing, out of beast mode. And I suppose I'm just starting to acknowledge like addiction. Like Adam said to me while we were away, he said, you know, I can't remember what I was talking about, green tea. I was I drunk like 10 green teas or something. And he was like, yeah, you know, it's just your new addiction. We're all addicts. And he's back smashing caffeine again. He hasn't had, had no caffeine for three years. And he's like, we're all addicts. And I was like, I think we are. As high performers, you're an addict. And like you said, you choose your poison. If you're addicted to going to the gym and weight training and running and and work and business, it's a lot better than being addicted to something that's going to be detrimental to you. So I think it's just an acknowledgement. And then you have to deal with that addiction. And when you're not working, you're like, right, well, what is my new poison sort of thing? So Do you think you'll go back in the 
because your your year of is the year of the middle lane or it's one of your objectives. Yeah. And do you think because I, I personally think that you're gonna you're just having a, a pit stop and I think I think you'll be back in the fast lane at, at some point when you get hungry again. Um, I think so. And what what yeah you I think uh, when you said it to me previously, I thought it was a, a possible outcome, but I didn't, you know, I didn't believe it. I was just like, nah, I'm never going back. You know, it's like when you have a hangover, I'm never drinking again. <laughs> Get to Wednesday, you're like, beer? <laughs> Obviously you're not because you're, you're not drinking, but um, have, I've got a, a new emerging peer group who are like people that are maybe five, 10 years ahead of me. They've made their money. They've done the big houses. They've had the kids. They've retired. And now they're starting to come back round to go again. So it's like it's interesting, and having seen Adam do it is is textbook. He he took three years, and now he's going like he's in his prime. I've never seen never seen anyone go like that before, uh, or I've never seen him go like that before. So I think the likelihood is yes, but equally I'm not I'm not committing to it just yet. You're up. That's a good one. So the interesting thing is my my one is balance. <laughs> interesting. So Dan, you're just about to have a, a family. Yes. And um, so you've got business, family, friendships. Um, so what, what, what do you see your, your kind of balance looking like over the next kind of um, short, medium and long term future? In the same way we just talked about beast mode, I don't think balance is anything I've or ever. When I look at like admirable thing, uh, aspirational things, it's not necessarily balance. I'm not looking for the perfectly balanced day to be completely dim sum you know like I'm completely chilled all the way through it what I'm looking for is enjoyment and when I've started doing some things in my house like I was de started decorating and just being on the tools and doing my bedroom and I clocked it like 11 o'clock one night I was wallpaper in the bedroom and was like this is the first time in probably five years I've been so in flow and enjoying something that I could I'd want to stay up all night and do it and then I had to stop myself and go to bed because obviously the addict in me would be like, what could be better than staying up till 11? I'll stay up all night and do it. So like, I don't think I'm actually chasing balance. What I'm chasing is enjoyment and satisfaction. And a friend of mine who used to work with me a long time ago said when I was sort of having a, you know, a bit of a search in time, looking at what I wanted to do when I was getting a bit sick with business, he was like, you'd always be a growth person, but you don't necessarily need to be growing businesses. You could go and grow, you could go and be, the manager of the kids football team or you could get involved in the school and whatever you do you'll do that thing and I've noticed now having done it with the charity and starting to do it around my house is I'm not looking to I've done the retirement and it was a complete false economy the romance was very different to the reality I actually want to be busy I want to be active I'm up at five I need to be doing stuff you know I've got to I've got to be busy um, and I suspect what I'm looking for now is I'm looking to be busy with the house and the family. So that would be my then full-time job. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my perspective at the minute. And, yeah, it'd be interesting to get your take on it. Um, how do you think um, having a baby is going to change your life? Um, I would say probably very naive in it. Um, I've listened to you and I've listened to Akash going all, all the stories and stuff and I suppose I still listen to it same as anyone would and be like yeah but it'll be different for me <laughs> you know it's not going to be that crazy um so I don't know I think it's going to be the good thing is it's going to be my priority so it's going to I want to be at the house I want to be doing stuff around the house I want to get involved with 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 having a family equally I'm building a new home office at the end of the, one of the fields and I'm going to go to work every day so like Sav's really keen for me to go to work and her to be at home and then aspirationally, I hope that I'll then come home and want to relieve her of, of the kid, take over, give her some respite. Yeah, I mean, that's my vision of it. I think it's going to be unpredictable. I've cleared my diary. I won't be here for two months. You know, I've, I'm trying my best to create the space. But I suppose it's like everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the nose, don't they? So. Yeah, I completely agree with that. What would your words of wisdom or insight be? In fact, you've given me it before, and I think uh, the reading's quite consistent. Yeah, I think I think it's it's one of those having a baby is one of those things that um, you can't. It's very difficult to share until you've done it. It's, it's the same as like being really fit or running a business or having children or having a like a significant experience in your life. Until until you've done it, it's you can you can try and share, but until you you feel it, it's 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 difficult to explain. Um, you just I think it's just. Um, I think one thing it did for Anetra and I, it really exaggerated our relationship in a in a nice way. 
So if if you are if you've got a great partner and things are bad, you'll you'll go over and above to help each other. So for example, Harry and Anetta was an ill, so I, I couldn't go to PE or or Just do pull your mic up. I couldn't go to PE or do things that I I wanted to do. Uh, because fam family comes first. So from a caring perspective, it really exaggerates. But then equally, I've seen people that maybe don't have the best relationship and then it exaggerates it as well on on kind of the, the wrong way. So so kids, kids, uh, and I think I think you feel a love that you've never felt before and you feel a fear that you've never felt before. So say, for example, every parent would have experienced their child, they think, think their child's choking. And that you go from like zero to twelve fear straight away. So and there's there's it's it's a it's a great experience. It's been a great experience so far, and we're just about to have our second. So we'll have two children under the age of sixteen, seventeen months. So that's going to be quite hectic, hectic for us. So uh, it's yeah, it's, it's going to be a great a great great time for it. Do you, do you have any uh, like a plan or strategy of how you're gonna how you're gonna look after the child or? Um, so I've been very transparent to Sav and said, I don't know how you're so chill. So we had the home visit last week and the home visit said to Sav, she's never met a, an, a first time expecting mother who's been so chilled. And, and I was, and Sav's not necessarily the most chill person. She can be quite nervous about stuff and things like that. But I say to her, I have no idea how we're going to keep this thing alive. I don't know how <laughs> to feed it. I don't know how to change its nappy. I do believe that if anyone can do it, I can do it to a degree. You know, everybody else is bringing kids up. Um, but Sav's like, yeah, she, you know, she's had, she's got brothers, sisters, nephews, you know, she's, she's like, honestly, it'll be fine. Anything we don't learn at NCT, I can show you. I like to go in, you know, normally I'm reading books. Obviously we're reading a book every day and like all that sort of stuff. But, um, as far as like preparing for it, it, all I'm doing is clearing the space and being able to be present. Also, I'm quite realistic that, well, I had some, uh, a guy, uh, who I met was in Bali actually, a very like spiritual guy. I said to him like, "What would what would your advice be?" And he said, "For if she's going to breastfeed, and that's going to be the sort of primary thing in the first few months, he's like, you're probably going to end up caring for her as much as you are the baby. And if you know if you're not already a ma like a man of service, you might want to get used to being the man, the person who's serving the partner rather than the other way around." And Adam was there and he was like, well, thankfully, like that's literally how Dan lives his life. So I was like being a man of service. I'm hopeful because that's my love language. I love being of service. I'm quite happy running around doing stuff. Hopefully it'll play to my strengths and, and there'll be that. And I think it's an, a lot of my friends have said, including you, I think, have said, get some help, you know, get a night nanny, get someone around the house. And like two two things, sort of things we came to. One was... Um, Sav and I said that may be what we we can see the value of that and it might be what we do for our second child or a month in but actually we want to experience the shit you know to like rather than avoid it go through it experience it and then make a decision realize it's crap and you need some help and then get some help and the other thing was uh I'm really I've thought about having kids and starting a family for years and I've always thought I'm never ready I'm not ready personally I'm not ready financially and people have actually laughed out loud and I've said that to them in the past and some a friend of mine who's just had her first child, who's two years old now, she messaged me the other day saying congratulations. And I said, any words of advice? And she said, um, she said, I think the biggest, uh, if you're feeling nervous and anxious, the biggest insight from her side would be the majority of problems that most people face bringing up kids. It's quite likely I won't have to deal with them. So like having to go to work 50 hours a week, not being able to afford to have a nice lifestyle, living in a small house where you're on top of each other the whole time. And I thought, you know what? Like, that's not something I've acknowledged. I've gone into it like I'm the bottom of, you know, I'm going to have the biggest challenge anyone's faced. Where actually, if I look at it, I've got Sav who knows it inside out. I've got the, the luxuries if I need it of getting help around the house. We've got, a slot, you know, we've got enough room in the house to have our own space. I'm going to have an office at the end of the garden. So, yeah, I feel very optimistic. I feel very excited. I don't feel prepared but I feel like I've created enough space that I can get punched in the face and the dominoes won't tumble. Very good. How naive is that on a scale of 10, <laughs> 1 to 10? Um, I think it's normal. I think it's okay. normal. I think it's normal. Um, yeah, I think I think the, the night nanny doesn't make it better. It makes it less worse. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so, uh, but it, it's, Fair enough. But it's... Um, 
So we're going to have one on the second child, maybe two, three nights a week, um, because it's a happy mummy, happy world, you know. And I, I completely agree with that sentiment. As long as mummy's happy, it doesn't matter if they breastfeed, bottle feed, or it doesn't really matter from my view. And it, and it doesn't matter if you you 100% disciplined on one thing and you do a 180 degree U turn the next day. It, it's 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 all kind of good. Um, it's just yeah, it's just an experience, and probably just embrace everything, embrace the good and the and the not so good. And do you have any any um, kind of aspirations of what kind of father you, you want to be? Have you have you thought about that? Yeah, I just want to be a natural father. I don't want to be naive and oblivious and not. I'll, I'm sure I'll intentionally develop as an individual as I start to learn learn it. But my aspiration is that I'm the same parent as I am a partner and a leader which I think is well-rounded. I think it's like a firm but fair. You know, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but if you want help doing it, I'll give you a hand. I'm not going to let you play the fool. I'm not going to let you take the piss. But equally, you know, I'm not going to be a disciplinarian and and that, I think. And also there's, you look at how you were parented. You know, most people either model their parents what they did or model what they didn't do. And I think, you know, that'll naturally play into it. But yeah, I just think, I I'll optimistically think I'll be like me. I, I Cause yeah, I just yeah, I just think I'll be like me. Like I'll be a friend, a parent, a partner, a leader, uh, you know, coach, mentor. I think that that that's my plan. Good, good, good. <laughs> Nicely done. That was a good one. Uh, so spirituality. Spirituality. So the meaning of life. <laughs> spirituality, like what? Is your take? Why are we all here? Do you think about it? What is spirituality? Is it something that's part of your life? Small question. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, nice, easy one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, so meaning of life for me is just be nice, do your best. Um, it's, 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 it's so complicated, like just to try and uh, think about how we got here, how the earth is here. Well, let's spitball. Where have you got to with that? Um, so you didn't get to see a picture that I've had put up in my bedroom because you didn't come to the uh, murder mystery dinner with the board but I've had this picture put up on my wall it's absolutely ginormous it must be I don't know how big it is I think it's seven and a half metres long about two and a half 2.9 metres high ginormous canvas and you look at it and it's the largest photo that's ever been taken of the universe from the Hubble telescope it's 20 million light years wide and it's 1,600 light years away from earth. And I just look at it, I lay in bed at night and look at it and think, what, somebody needs to explain this to me. I, I think the reality or my reality is that the, the likelihood of us ever knowing in our lifetime is, is low. You, you have a, there's, I can't remember what book it was, but I was reading, it, talk, it talks about, the evolution and there's some fundamental flaws in some of the calculations that they've assumed um which i don't know if it's, it's right or wrong because i didn't i didn't sense check that but i i i don't know where the world came from i i, I often think about it i, I do you yeah it's, it's what it's, do you think about i just think how incredible it is how incredible it is that we are on this sphere spinning around in the middle of nowhere and we have we have life on here and i think and do you actually believe that I don't. I probably don't give it enough thought to not believe it. Probably I, for the best. <laughs> I, I, I assume that that's 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 what's happening, uh, but I don't. I don't really give it much thought. Apart from that, I I think, I think with it's because we're so insignificant. Like in reality, like when we die, in you know, what's your great grandparent's name, or, or if you think about someone that's not famous, like the you know now the now the Queen's passed away, it it's it, she's she's not forgotten she, she'll get remembered but it's she's not a significant the significant goes very very quickly um so i think i think that's yeah that's that's the interesting thing about life life for me it's just it's just about now um i think Do you, would you say you practice that because it's a very easy thing to say you know it's all about just be present life sure enjoy it do you practice what you preach or do you do you think it and practice it or do you is it just the way you explain it to yourself so I think I think for me the way I'd articulate it is if I am to think externally or I'm to think outwardly and not inwardly, um, I'm winning. So it's when I go inwardly and think about myself and me, 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 that 
that's when that's when my world kind of shortens. But if I'm thinking more more abundance, then then that's that's when that's when I think sp- spirituality works for me. Meditation, uh, reading, growth. Uh, I think human connection is is massive for me. So those those are the kind of fundamental things that that work really well. And when we talk about spirituality, for people who are listening to it and probably thinking about sort of uh, meditation and yoga and maybe even like the universe, when somebody when somebody says spirituality to you, what does it what does it mean? <laughs> um, it, it could mean many things, <laughs> ranging from um, psychedelics to um, sitting in a cave meditating. I, th- I think I think the word spirituality is is so vast that you've got so many different so I, I think mindfulness is is probably a good a good explanation of, of that i think spiritual our, well what would the, what would the exact definition of spirituality be it's a good question i don't know yeah because i mean you could put it you could put it in a some people could put it in a club as like a religion like a following of your belief your practices your value set um but yeah, it's like, what is it? What is spirituality? Um, what about you? Because I, th- I remember at, at times in your life, you, you would go completely down a rabbit hole for a long period of time. And then I think Sam's dragged you out from time to time. Yeah, it plagues me. It, honestly, it plagues me. When w- If I have enough time to think about it or I'm in a dark place or I'm hungover or burnt out, I just straight away go to like, what's the meaning of life? Why are we here? Not because I'm not depressed, but it can blow my mind. Naval, who's a fantastic, you know who Naval Ravikant is. Yeah. He, for those who are listening, he's a fantastic modern day philosopher. And he says, you get to a point where you've just got to stop saying how and start saying wow, because it can blow my brain. Like I can lay there in bed at night and look at that photo of the universe. And I get to the point where I'm just like, it's just not true. It doesn't exist because I can't, I can't think it exists. But then equally, I look at my life sometimes and I just think, I can't believe like there's a, a Wayne Dyer quote that says, you are God. And he says, you are God. And if you follow some of the spiritual texts, it talks about you are God because we are all the same thing and God is the same thing and you and I are part of the same thing. The earth, the universe, and whether that's a conscious matter or it's like a spiritual connection or it's the physical structure of energy, whatever you want to believe. It's like I I genuinely regularly think that I've... I believe that you've got far more control than you think over this life. Agreed. I also believe you've got far less control than you think over I'd this life. I agree with that as well, yeah. And I, I, that's how I believe. I, I, I get to the point where I have to stop thinking about it because it can drive me nuts. I'm a very deep thinker. Rob, my driver, who's out there meditating now, he said, I, I, I can't, he picked me up one day, hung over at Christmas from Exeter or somewhere. We had like a four-hour drive home. And I was asking him really deep questions. And I said, what do you think about that? He goes, honestly? He goes, you need to stop thinking. <laughs> And I was like, you're probably right. I, I can drive myself down a hole for it. Equally, I think it's the way I live my life. So it's, I won't, I'm not trying to get rid of it. I, th- I think fundamentally, like we, we just want to be happy. We just want to be happy, fulfilled, have per, per, uh, purpose in our life. Um, I think gratitude was a big one for me recently uh, with regards to spirituality. I, I think I'd put gratitude in there. I think I think I found it hard to be grateful when I was younger because I, I almost had... Um, Am I worthy of what I've achieved in a way? Um, so being grateful for for the lifestyle we have now and, and what, what we do on a regular basis, I, th- I think that's been a, a bit of a game changer for me me as well. Off topic on that, with, uh, just to f- finish off, in fact, no, we've got plenty of time. Um, on the sort of uh, high, a lot of high performers, most high performers come from uh, driving parents' expectations or experience of failure and that sort of drive, not necessarily uh, spirituality, but they have that desire, that pain they're trying to get away from, whatever it is. Definitely true for me, true for most high performers. Um, When you talk about like self-worth and self-esteem, one of the things I realized in the last six months or so is I've I've got a very high self-esteem. I've got the awards. I feel very confident. I feel very capable. But what I realized is I actually have a low self-worth, which means I undervalue my time. I do things for free. I put others ahead of myself. And I've actually done a lot of really deep work on that over the last three months. And I feel like now I'm coming out of it. And it's fund- it's really changing my life, the way I think and the way I feel. Would you Have you ever clocked the difference? And would you say that you have a similar mirror on that? Or would you say that 
you, you're aware of the difference and actually you feel very comfortable at both of your levels. For me personally? For you, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say that when I joined the board at Property Entrepreneur, that was a game changer for me because I, I was relatively successful in my own little world and I, I had nobody to benchmark myself against um, that is kind of on a sim similar path. And uh, I was almost embarrassed about the success I had in my business and didn't really speak about it. But when I when I was amongst like a, a peer group, and I think I think for me the key thing the the change was when I was respected amongst the group that I respect. For me, that that gave me uh, almost permission to myself to think, oh, actually, I'm I'm okay. Uh, so that that was that was that was probably it's probably about three years ago when I I got to a period in, in my own mind where I'm at peace with myself. I'm not like, um, yeah, I'm not doubting myself anymore. I doubt myself. Um, I doubt what I d me as a person. I don't doubt myself. I'm, I'm comfortable in my own skin now. And that that was that was just from um, from being around a group of people that I now class as peers. Yeah, that's really nice. And I would say that's my experience. Like I would say recently, I feel like I am as good as I am. Whereas previously, I would not think I, that whole thing we talk about high performers. Other people think they're up here. They're actually probably a little bit further down. They think they're a lot lower down. And I feel like having gone through this motion, this breakthrough, and now having a peer group of people that are doing the things that I want to do and, and gives me permission to do it. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting thing. But I'm glad it's come together for both of us because that's, that's quite a recent thing on both fronts. So we don't know what the meaning of life is then. I've got no idea, no <laughs> idea. Um, so the second one was about, sorry, my, th my last question is more about reflection, really. Okay. So if you was going to go back to, say, 20-year-old Dan and, um, and just, just kind of get into his mind again, what, what would he be thinking? So what kind, of, what kind of goals would you have back then? What were your fears, aspirations? And what would, what would success look like for you back then? So when I talked earlier about uh, I can't I look at my life sometimes and just can't believe I'm here. But then equally, I just believe that I always believed I was here. Uh, Helen, my dad's wife, my stepmom, said to me after my dad died, um, "Did you ever think that you and you did you ever think that you'd get to this period, like get to this thing in your life?" Because my dad never saw the Rolls Royce, he never saw the new house, and we were sitting there. And she said, "Do you think like if your dad had seen this, do you think you'd have ever got to this point?" And in my head, I was just like, "Yeah, I just always did think." not in an arrogant way, like Warren Buffett says, ever since he was a kid, he just knew he would be wealthy. And I just always knew that I would go on this journey. And also because I'm stoic, I'm quite indifferent. Like if someone rang me now and said, the property market has been taken over by the government, you know, you're going to, you're going to have to start again. Sav and I would quite happily go and live on a narrowboat again and just live on beans and bread. Like it's, uh, yeah, I've, I think the, the whole thing of where did I want to get to, I was always clear. I just wanted to keep moving forward. That's probably the clique. Like you said earlier, I just want to keep moving forward, keep understanding each level. So that's not a su surprise and not something I'd probably say to them. The only thing, like I said earlier, would be keep going. There's been times where I, I could have stopped and I never once thought I wouldn't stop. And nobody ever told me to stop. My parents, my, my, my friends saw me in emotional wreck, burnout, physical, you know, ruin. And although they said, like, get a rest, look after yourself, nobody ever told me to stop, which is quite... Yeah, quite a, a significant thing. I think the biggest game changer I would have told 20-year-old 20, 20 Dan is 20-year-old Dan was out for what 20-year-old Dan wanted and he was arrogant. He was... I don't know if arrogance fair because I've always been quite... A, like, I've got on with people, but I was probably... I was putting my own objectives ahead of everybody else's. And then in 2012, I learned from one of my mentors that if you want to achieve your own dreams, the secret is to figure out how to help other people achieve theirs. And that just changed the game for me. When I started to learn that I need to lead from the back, help other people, and then you can help yourself. The more you give, the more you get. That took my, my organic growth into exponential growth by realizing it's, a, you know, it's, it's not a one-player game. It's, it's a, that's the game to play. That would be my big trigger point that I, I could have learned earlier. What what were the bigger fears that you had when when you were younger, or what was your your biggest obstacles, or your perception of your obstacles? I guess looking back now. So I always thought I'd die young, and I'm only just shaking that off. Although it didn't help that my dad died young, I always thought I'd die young because my dad always said I'm going to die in ten years. And then when he died, I said at his funeral, 
I said, you know, most of you are surprised to be here, but I, I was, my dad's been saying he's going to die for 10 years and he's been telling me that for 15. <laughs> so actually I was on borrowed time. That was definitely drilled into me, not intentionally, but that was something that held me back. But also it drove me. I've always been panicked. I've always been like when I was starting, I was like, I need to make this success now. And then when I started making money, I always thought this could be the last pound I make. So I've always had that scarcity mindset and fear of running out, losing it. So I've always been, I've always played for the long game. So I've tried to keep fit and healthy. I save my money rather than spending it. And now I feel like I'm at a position where I'm going to see the benefit of that. But yeah, probably 20 years of just desperation. Des desperation. I was desperate to be successful, like, like life or death. So if you was to kind of look at where you are now from back when you was younger, did you, 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 won't, you won't be surprised with that. You would, you would. No, oh, that's good. That's well, not good. in an arrogant way. Like that can that's probably going to come across arrogant, but really not. Yeah. But also because I'm not connected to it, it just is what it yeah. is. It's like every level has another devil. I also look at me and twenty year old Dan. If you put them next to each other in a pub, they'd have a great time. <laughs> they'd just be like, like I'm still the same person. I always had this vision that I would be and feel different. Mm. And what I realised with this hedonic treadmill is or Ferris wheel is, you get there to where you want to get to, running the marathon, or whatever. 10,000 Instagram followers this week. As soon as I hit it, I knew I'd be like, not interested anymore. I got it. I was like, oh, not even bothered telling anyone. And what about, would you say you're content with where you are now? Or have you still, you still got the hunger to keep going? Oh, oh I, I guess, are you grateful for where you are now? Or is there something still that, that just wants you to kick on? Yeah, I'm grateful uh, in more of a paranoid sense. So I manage my money meticulously because I'm like, I don't want to lose it snakes and ladders i don't want to go back to the beginning i could do it again but i don't want to do it again um i am grateful i am grateful i, I walk around sometimes and say i can't believe this is life and i look at what the alternative would look like you know 40 hours a week for 40 years in a job i didn't like and that to me sounds sounds horrendous and actually i'm very inspired and motivated to help to help other people do it and um, my definition of success now is is if I can feel content and feel present. Like it doesn't mean I'm not doing anything. It means I'm having a day where I'm enjoying it. You know, I'm doing, I'm out in the garden. I'm doing stuff I want to do. And when I have a bad day of doing stuff I don't want to do, it just reminds me that I want to keep moving to the next level. And um, would you say you've nailed life life by design now? Would you say you're living your your best life? Yeah, no, definitely not. I'd no. say. If you think about property entrepreneurs, wealth, health, uh, wealth, health, and life by design, I say wealth nailed it. Could teach anyone how to do it. Health, I would say I'm ninety, eighty between eighty percent there. The, the the gains I'm looking for now are like considered to the masses. They're they're tiny. Life by design is my new thing. I would say someone like Adam has nailed life by design. For me, I'm I'm in the first steps of of enjoying it. And I'm now when I talked earlier about breaking through and enjoying life and putting life before work it's when i i'm still not there i'm but i'm on i'm halfway there what the, the days that i have when i see it like i'm playing snoo like my new peer group who've all sold their companies and you know they're still making millions of pounds a year but they're playing snooker at two o'clock in the afternoon on a wednesday the first time i did that it was horrendous i felt uncomfortable i was like this is just an oddity now i do it quite frequently i'll go to the gym with them in the afternoon i'm seeing what life can be like at that level and that's what i'm really looking forward to and i'm just trying to remind myself i deserve it i don't need to be available i don't need to be around and in two weeks time when i step down from my executive role um at property entrepreneur that will be the or and all my companies the last companies that'll be the last thing for me of like then i've got to make it happen so as we go around these two cycles um uh, i can't remember what the book was now um the is it the Arthur Brooks? Yeah, Arthur Brooks. So as you go around the, the the second, so the first cycles just work really hard, and the second cycles kind of more mentoring. Yeah. So how do you see how do you see that um, in the future? So what what would your aspirations be moving into say twenty years time? Well, I'm trying not to get carried away with it, but there's a great chapter in Way of Superior Man that says if you create enough space for the next thing, it will come. Don't go looking for it. Don't get restless. It will come. And really, since I sold Multilet in 2020, I've been waiting for that next thing. And actually, the reality is I just don't think I create enough space for it, enough time for it. But the thing that's now landing and I'm becoming increasingly committed to, passionate about, locked into, is living off the steam. It's just creating a, 
is just going big on living off the steam and teaching people whether you need to make 25 grand a year or you want to make half a million quid a year living off the steam is the only game in town uh, isn't it it's, it's a phenomenal game <laughs> yeah it's, yeah it's it's once yeah once you get to that position it's just it's just utopia it's just the only game in town and i, th I feel like that'll be my next thing um but also becoming a father i think will change me like i'm already emotionally changing i don't feel emotionally connected and real that i'm having a, a kid logically i understand it and i get excited and it's like this is good but that emotional connection that people talk about about becoming a father i don't think i'll have that until after the birth but when I'm walking around like the garden, I have this, I'm getting the chickens delivered. And in my head, I was thinking, oh, when the kids are old enough, they'll be able to collect the eggs, put them in the honesty box on the front garden. People will buy the eggs, give the money, and that will teach them how, how money works. I just started like not crying, but my eyes started like welling up, like thinking about it. And I think, oh, that's that emotional connection I've been looking for for probably five years or so that I used to have as an entrepreneur. And I feel like now I'm just ready for the next chapter, which will probably be kids or it will be kids. And then it, I'm sure then that will give me even more drive to do the next thing. And, you know, I'll go on that journey. Happy days. Oh, that was very focused on my answers, that one. But I really, really enjoyed the questions. Thank you for those. Right. Last but not least. Dun, 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 dun. We've covered both of them loosely, so maybe I'll do both of them. So the first one is uh, how does your brain work? So... How does your brain work? What do you think on a daily basis? How do you process thoughts? Like everyone's brain's different. How does yours work? And then as, you, as you're describing it, try and come up with an analogy that describes visually how your brain works. So when I used to be an entrepreneur, when I was a very busy entrepreneur, the way I described my brain was as a lottery machine. All the balls round, bouncing around all day, every day. But then eventually something amazing with seven fantastic things would drop out of the bottom. I don't know what mine's like now, but I'm hoping through this conversation we can figure it out for both of us. How does my brain work? So I would say I've always got... So Garrett and I, Garrett's my business partner. He's a tempo and I'm a kind of a creator blaze. And, and I think my, my brain work. I'm always in the future. Um, I'm always thinking about the future. Um, and I've, I'm always... I. I it's, just, it's like I see a jigsaw puzzle on the table. I see all the pieces. I see all these different pieces, and um, and I, I can see what picture we could we can make. And sometimes some of the pieces won't work, and you need to throw them away. But sometimes some of the pieces that you thought might be good are, are great. So I think I think my my brain works. It, I kind of love bringing things together, whether it's people, community, uh, culture, uh, business. Uh, my my. I think my brain just is connection. I'd say it works. It works best. That that's what I'm. That's that's where. Yeah, that's that's where I I would say I would say it works. And what sort of journey uh, as a you know active participant or as an innocent bystander? What active what what journey does your brain take you on like on a daily basis? Do you, do you have highs lows? Are you introspective? Are you completely extra like extroverted? I, I like. I like being around people, but equally I, I do like my own time. I, I like I like being on my I like being on my on my own. Uh, I'm generally I'm generally happy most of the time. I'm generally at peace or I'm generally chilled out most of the time. When I am not happy is generally like when I'm stressed or when things are you know when things are getting on top of me. But ge generally I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty I'm pretty relaxed. I'm pretty I'm pretty chilled out. I think I think running helps that a lot though. How do you think and feel when you are stressed? Um, I get very dictatorial, as in like, this is what we're going to do. I take control and try and control, uh, manage my or manage the situation out as quickly as possible. Um, I, yeah, so if, if I, I can tell when I'm really, really, really stressed, because I, I sometimes I just feel like crying. Yeah, that's my that's my like, you know, when I'm just feeling sad and and I just feel like crying that that's when I'm I know that I'm like burnt out, stressed. <laughs> things are, you know, and that that's my that's kind of my signal that things are things are going too far. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, mine's not necessarily mine's when I'm stressed, I feel anxious. I can feel it in my stomach. Yeah, I feel like uh, everything seems just it's the whole thing, yeah, not burying your head in the sand, but everything's just overwhelming. And 
the stress then compounds. When I get stressed, it compounds and it compounds. And it can take something simple like me putting, sitting down and putting my to-do list together or getting a couple of jobs done. I'm like, oh, the world's not <sighs> going to end. But I hate, especially in recent years, I hate chasing my tail. I hate being uh, chased for deadlines. I don't like not having enough time to do a good quality work. I don't like having to do good quality work when I don't want to do good quality work. So if, I, if I'm not feeling it one day, I don't want to sit down then and have to get it done because it's just not good. Whereas if I'm in my cave and I've got time to do it, it flows and it's amazing. Um, what about sort of like self-talk and self-chat? What, what, what does your brain say to you when you're conversing? Uh, Where does that even come from? <laughs> loads, of, loads of deep questions today. So my, my self-talk's relatively good when I'm in um, a normal state of mind. So say like chill, relaxed. When I'm, when I'm stressed, I do get sometimes anxious. Um, I guess I become emotionally fragile. So what I mean by that is generally my mind's relatively strong. I, if I say I'm going to go running at this time or do do certain things or get things done, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty good like that. Um, I Yeah, so I'd, I'd probably be fragile sometimes. That, that's when I know that things aren't, aren't going to plan. Uh, so what was the original? I don't know. It was just sort of spitballing. But with the uh, when, when you think about the type of brain, I was saying about self talk yeah. and like oh, self talk. Sorry. Um, yeah. G generally, my mind's fine. I, I don't. I don't. Um, I beat myself up sometimes by by not doing what I want to do. But I, I think I think there's a a philosophy that I use is do do my best. If I do my best and be my best, then I'm proud of myself, regardless of what the result is. So if I go out for uh, New York Marathon is a great, a great example. I uh, I went out at sub two four five pace, and uh, detonated horrendously, <laughs> and ended up walking the last four miles and finished in three twenty nine. But I'm really proud of myself. Yeah, although, although, although my time's horrendous for me personally, I'm just really proud that I did my best on the day. I couldn't have gone any faster, and and so for me that's that that's fine. Do you feed that back as a leader and a manager, and like do you think you'd do that as a parent? Because I think that's a very strong mindset yeah. to have yeah do, do do or be your best yeah definitely definitely i think i think that's that's and and the, i think the other thing is is if i take responsibility for myself which is which is one of my things that i do then i'm i'm happy so if i start blaming people or blaming situations or you know that that's kind of when self taught is i think i think i can see where that can go quite badly where if it's like ultimately everything's my responsibility, then then essentially you you, you well, I personally just need to everything in my life is my fault. Yeah. So I think I think that's that's kind of where where I am in my brain a lot a lot of the time. And when you go in like high performance and you're thinking about the way your brain works, so like when you when you listen to people like David Goggins, I love they, I love David Goggins. Yeah, David Goggins, Tim Tim, what's his name? Did Relentless the book? Uh, he was Michael Jordan's coach. Tim Glover, I think. Tim maybe. Glover, that's yeah. it. And he took. The, the scripts that he talks about is just the stuff that we use by default to mm. drive ourselves, not necessarily the most uh, self-loving approach to life. But when you think about your brain and what enables you to run marathon sub 245, go running in the snow, turn around companies, you know, what what is it? What's going through your head at that time? I'm pretty hard on myself. So I think you 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 explained it best once you said you're the worst boss in the world yeah <laughs> so, so for me I, I i make myself do stuff that i wouldn't expect anyone anyone else to do so so i think i think from you know what goes on in my head but i i, just, I see it as a challenge and I, I that's good and bad at the same time but um yeah i, I, I see sometimes i just see, see things as a, a challenge how you know what 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 can i do and for people listening to this that like aspire to be doing the stuff you're doing but they don't get up they don't go running they don't go training they don't do those things. What, when their brain is saying, "Don't worry about it. It's raining outside. Nobody else is going running today." I'll, Mine I'll... says the same. My, I, I don't. <laughs> it really? So it's it's. There's those who. Well, you can either do it or you don't do it. So it's just it's just the commitment. If you want to be successful, in my opinion, it's just keeping your promises to yourself. So if you tell yourself you're going to go uh, running at whatever time in the morning, I I, I help myself by. I'll get all my running stuff out the night before. It's all ready, ready for me. I'll set my alarm in my office and not my bedroom. So I have to get out of my bed or my office is going to get on. So now I've got out of my bed, I put my running stuff on and then I've got my running stuff on and then I've got a pint of water next next to me. So it's just 
it's not it's not you don't do it from day one it, it's you fail millions and millions and billions of times first and then it's something that you slowly build up to but it's just it's just setting yourself small promises that you can keep and then just keep compounding and compounding and compounding and then what you see now whether it's something that you do in business or whether it's something that I do in business or running or whatever whatever it is it's it's the compound effect from a significant amount of failure at first which is w what everyone goes through and then just the discipline and relentlessness to to continue and, and carry on. And that's not this, that's not the answer I was expecting, but it's definitely the best answer. I remember hearing David Goggins say that he doesn't go. He walks around. He, he can walk around his apartment for forty minutes looking at his trainers before he actually goes. And that's reassuring. You know, people want to know you're human. Equally, it's like you know they say never meet your heroes, but equally the ultimate decision is did you go running or or did you not sort of thing. So, yeah, that's that's good to know. And when uh, there's another great saying which says uh, nobody ever want nobody ever uh, looks forward to going to the gym, but they're glad. Everyone's always glad that they have that they've gone. Would you say it's the same for you with running? Even if like you, the reason you do it is you want that satisfaction afterwards, or and actually if you didn't go, that fear of you know that pain of discipline rather than the pain of regret. You only regret the runs that you don't do. You never is that true? You, yeah. you only regret the runs that you don't do. You never, you never finish your run and regret it. So it's 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 the same. It's the same thing. Nice, very good. Just to finish off because we're out of time. The other one was I was going to ask. I was going to check in about your drinking. Last time we spoke, we we both said about why do we keep talking about alcohol? It keeps showing up. You know what? What is the crack? And just to quick thirty seconds to summarize, you decided to stop drinking altogether this year. How's that gone? Yeah, really well. So um, I've. We had a as a topic on one of the last uh, podcasts we that did. That was sorry, that was one. Uh, so um, I used to drink every day, one to three beers a day for loads of years, and then about four four years ago, I did four and a half months no alcohol, and it was like going from black and white to color. And I kind of played with alcohol a little bit, as in like drank it sometimes, drank it not other times. And and I think for me now, it's longevity is really important. So. The way I look at alcohol now is it, it's there's nothing good about it. I've never woken up in the morning and thought, I wish I, I, wish I had a bigger headache or I wish I, I drank one more drink. And I think I think if you can, where I came to is I started to look long term. So if you look at, you don't care what happens tomorrow when you're younger, you can go out and drink loads of beer and it, it doesn't matter. But when you start thinking about like, I, I want to live to 100 and not just get to 100, but be but be fully functional and, and um, a kick-ass centurion, then, then that that was when I I decided to just have a whole year off beer because it's once I could see the future, then then the alcohol just I didn't see any value in in having having. And I assume it. it's going great. No, not not missing it. No, not not seeing huge benefit. Not and, and especially having a young child and a young one on the way. There's having a hangover with children must be horrendous. So yeah, yeah don't don't miss it one bit. And reckon you go back. Um, I've I've not I've not thought about it. I think I don't think it'll be a thing that I I do properly again. Um, it's I used a bad to be, habit you've you've made. Yeah, I've, I've shifted, and I think after I get through through a year, I, I yeah, I, and and the the zero Guinness now is amazing. Yeah, I, yeah, it's really good. But uh, but yeah, I, I don't I don't think I don't think I'll drink excessively ever again in my life. Fair play. We'll regroup on that in another eighteen months time, ladies and gentlemen. Ian Bauer, six rounds. Do you want to hit the bells? Finish. Nicely done. Thank you.